Welcome to the Online Strength Coach Podcast, episode 65, Plyometrics for Athletes. Hello and welcome to episode 65, or what I assume is episode 65 of the Online Strength Coach Podcast. Today is Monday, the 18th of January, 2016. Today's question comes via the Rare Beast, which is a private message on YouTube, something I didn't even really know people used. It comes from Dasik69. Hi, I came across your channel when trying to find out more about plyometrics and saw your rebuttal of the claims that Speed of Sport had made. I have no idea whether you answer PMs, but I perceived you to be a professional and scientifically objective about training, so I thought I'd ask you about plyometrics. Plyometrics is fun- fundamentally about putting a load on a muscle to which the muscle will supposedly react with optimal motor unit recruitment, which is used to get the fastest muscle recruitment rate possible out of the muscle that's been trained. Assuming that this is true, how is this useful for an athlete? You can train the nervous system to react to an opposite load, How will this aid, say, a boxer and pop into jab with no revealing prior movement? Prior movement that is opposite to the punch. Hugely grateful grateful for some insight. Okay. um, It's on on that um, speed of sport uh, video. It's one that I've actually got quite a lot of negative feedback on. Loads of dislikes and... (laughs) My, my first kind of bit of hater um, comments, which I think is a sign that I'm doing something correct. And I rewatched it um, like Saturday or Friday, and I can't really see anything too wrong with it. Uh, so, yeah, I can't really understand where a lot of the haters coming from. Anyway, that's, that's an aside. Um, that was the old question and answer series, which is basically this podcast, but with a video. Um, I think it's episode 23 or something like that. I'll, maybe, I'll link it in the description in case you want to look at it. Yeah, so basically, plyometrics is a, a training method normally used for jumping and sprinting sports. So the general thesis is that you use um, gravity as an overload for the tendon, so the mus- muscular tendinous joint or muscular tendinous unit of a joint so for example within the ankle you utilize the calf muscle and the tendons and the structure around the joint um, as a spring basically and you train the springiness of that um, of that unit what it's called is a stretch shortening cycle so basically when you put um, a joint or a muscle under a, a rapid stretch what you can do you can rebound that stretch and kind of utilize it like an elastic band. And what that can do, it can that rapid stretching can um, cause a an inhibition of the Golgi tendon, which the Golgi, the Golgi tendon uh, lies along the, the the muscle belly. And it, uh, I'm probably a little bit off on what I'm saying, uh, but the Golgi tendon stops rapid force production, and then the muscle spindle. Um, is another inhib- inhibitory mechanism within the muscle that stops um, you changing the length of the muscle too quickly. I might have mixed them two up. It's been a little while since I've looked at this in any great detail. But the basic thesis is um, that by training, so like depth jumps are, are a typical kind of plyometric and they're kind of the gold standard of a plyometric. Um, Vershansky or any of the, the Russian kind of literature that you'll find on this produced in the 70s or the 80s calls the shock training. Um, and it's basically from depth jumps, so like depth jumps of a meter, one half meters, two meters, primarily used with high jump athletes. Um, also can be used with um, long jumpers, triple jumpers. And it basically what it does is it, it trains someone's ability to react to be reactively strong there's a there's something we use in strength conditioning called the reactive strength index and that basically measures your ability to reverse a force so if you're 100 you're 100 kilos and you 
step off a box of 50 centimeters, then based on the ground contact time, the, the, the ground contact time is the amount of time you spend on the floor, and your eventual jump height, we can use these, um, and the box height, we can use this to put into an equation to give you a reactive strength index score, and that basically shows how reactively strong you are, or basically how well you utilize your stretch shortening cycle to to utilize or to to take advantage of the elastic nature of your tendon and muscle unit to produce like a springy force. Um, this is not <laughs> the most elegant explanation scientifically of what it is, but there might, there's a little, little bit of error in what I'm saying, but conceptually it's is pretty much exactly correct. Um, so yeah, so that's what kind of plyometric training does. Plyometric training increases our, the goal of plyometric training is to increase the, your efficiency of producing force quickly while well, using gravity only, um, using the force of gravity or you falling uh, and reacting to that and reapplying that kind of ground reaction force into like a, a vertical force or magnifying that force to produce like a jump or to produce like a sprint. So where this would be useful is not useful in acceleration. Um, if you use this is use sprinting. This is typically a jumping or a sprinting athlete where we would utilize this kind of training primarily. It's not the worth of plyometrics within boxing and like MMA and Mai Tai. We'll discuss as an aside, however, it's that kind of training is not really where this originates from. This originates almost almost exclusively from track and field and primarily primarily high jumpers. And um, although it's utilized by sprinters and long distance runners. Um, so for example, we use sprinting. Sprinting is quite an easy one to kind of conceptualize and show where this might be effective. So Let's say for the first five steps of your acceleration. So you're starting from a dead stop. You have to overcome inertia. You have a longer ground contact time. So let's say your feet are on the floor for 300 milliseconds or 400 mill, three to 500 milliseconds. Let's say it's somewhere in that ballpark. You have that amount of time to push a vertical and horizontal force vector into the floor. Once you start to accelerate up towards 80% to 100% of your max, you start doing if you're um, you will start having ground contact times of 80 to 120 milliseconds, which is very, very quick. Um, of this time, I'm sorry, you don't really have a lot of time to produce force. So how you can produce force uh, quickly is by having a very good um, plyometric response or having a, being able to utilize that stretch shortening cycle quickly and efficiently to rebound and Push, put a high lot of force into the ground, so you end up. Well, if you watch a good sprinter, you'll see them float. So if you watch their hips, or if you track their head, or you track their shoulders, or track their hips, um, as like a horizontal line, you should see like a fairly flat line when they get into top flight because they'll be just like bouncing off the floor. Um, they'll be using a pretty efficient gait to keep that high vertical force production and allow them to kind of glide. Now you'll get someone with a poor technique or someone with a poor stretch shortening cycle or someone who isn't good plyometrically, what you'll get, you'll kind of get them like a plodding kind of sprint. So they'll have to, they'll require more knee bend, more ankle bend, more flex in the ankle of the knee because they'll have to kind of soak up the force and then reapply it. So if you were to do that same vertical trace, or sorry, that same horizontal trace of their hips or head or their Shoulders, you'd see like an up and down movement, or you see like an undulating kind of graph or an undulating line. That's someone who is not good plyometrically. So they can be as strong as they want, and they can be as powerful as they want, but if they're not good plyometrically, or if they're not trained to reapply that vertical force or reapply that reaction force vertically, or to be plyometrically good, or be stiff around the, the knee, stiff around the ankle, like a spring, so they can. Uh, reactively utilize that that the, the force or the kinetic energy that gravity gives them to to a vertical force vector to allow them to sprint or allow them to stay kind of to allow them 
to not spend a lot of time on the ground and to move quickly or to glide. If they haven't got that ability, they're plyometrically shit. They're plyometrically not great. They'll have to like work eccentrically, concentrically, so they'll have to like eccentrically soak up the force and then concentrically reapply force vertically. So they'll be effectively like landing and jumping rather than just kind of like touching the floor and like boom, 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 and just like kind of gliding. So in a sprinting context, your plyometrically, but your plyometric ability or train plyometrics is extremely relevant for your top end strength or your stop your top end uh, sprinting ability or your your ability to hold your hold your force or sorry hold your force to hold your velocity efficiently. It's not relevant for starting really. So jump training can be relevant for starting. So so plyometric training isn't jump training. Jump training might be something like uh, doing like a counter one counter movement jump. So one jump to produce as much vertical force as you can. That's not plyometrics. That's jump training. Um, leaps and bounds. That's not really plyometric. That's jump training. And the reason we distinguish between jump training and plyometrics is plyometrics really has to happen within a certain small time frame or, or in a certain constraint. So an example of a, of a plyometric would be a depth jump that we've already used. It's quite the quite essential plyometric where you step off a... You step off like a 50 centimeter box, land and try return that force into the floor as quickly as you can to produce like a vertical jump. And you want to be, if you have like an opto jump or you have some kind of, like a, <clears throat> you have a light mat or a pressure mat or some kind of bit of kit to determine how long that ground time contact time is, ideally you want to be on, on the floor for less than 120 milliseconds, certainly less than 150 milliseconds. We start getting 150 to 200 that starts becoming slow over 200 becomes real slow and um, because we're not training the mechanisms or the the physiological mechanisms that uh, that are plyometric in nature so things that you'll see people call plyometrics uh, like box jumps it's not a plyometric it's a jump and um, hurdle jumps can be plyometric in nature Depends on the ground contact night. It depends on the ground contact time and how the athlete performs them. Some athletes will perform a beautiful plyometric drill over hurdles. Others will be an absolute shit show. They'll jump, have to land, they'll knee valgus, a lot of knee flexion, hip flexion, trunk lean. They'll have to like control and reapply, so they're effectively jumping over each um, hurdle. Whereas someone who's plyometrically good, what they'll do They'll jump over the first hurdle, so they'll bend the knees, bend the hips, slight, um, slight trunk lean, then they'll apply the quadriceps, glutes, whatever, and the extension. That extension will lead to a flight. From that flight, what you'll see when they land on the next hurdle, you'll see a small knee bend, you'll see a small ankle bend, and then you'll see them pop straight up. Their trunk will remain stiff, or should remain stiff, maybe a slight amount of lean, and um, if they have good knee control, their knees will kind of go over their in line with their toes. They won't fall, I guess. You'll basically see the lower body will be stiff like a spring, and you'll see pop, 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 pop over the top of the hurdles. And that that's a good plyometric. The difference between a plyometric that's kind of the difference between a plyometric and jump training. Jump training is more of a it's more application of forces with the muscles. So when I say that, like an application of force with the muscles would be a back squat. That's a force application. With, that's a muscular force application. A squat jump is muscular force activation, or yeah, muscular force application, not activation. Uh, a current movement jump is the same. Box jump is the same. Where to generate the force, to generate the momentum, the athlete needs to go into concentric movement and then willfully extend. At we're talking about jump training or sprinting. We're talking knees, ankles, and hips. They have to ballistically extend to produce the flight. When we're talking plyometrics, they will already be in flight, so they'll achieve that either by something like a tuck jump, for instance, would be a plyometric. A pogo jump would be a plyometric. A well-performed hurdle jump is a plyometric. Running is a plyometric. Um, well, like single leg bounds can be a plyometric, although... They're probably getting into the slower end of things. They're probably not plyometric. Um, things that are slower, where you need to eccentrically, concentrically produce force, 
we call jump training, and then plyometrics is about utilizing gravity, the stretch running the cycle, and being efficient or being springy. So if you watch, um, for example, of this, if you watch Stefan Holmes, um, I'll maybe put a link to that as well. You'll see someone producing a very, very good plyometric drill where they're you see the little kind of skinny dude jumping over the five foot ten hurdles. He's not producing that from muscular effort or strength. He's producing that force from being extremely springy and extremely efficient at, a, at um, utilizing the step that he's taking. So he steps into it and then boom, he springs up magically. You know, the guy traveling five foot ten in the air. That's because plyometrically he's outstanding. Strength wise, he well, I don't know, but I'm I'm going to guess he won't be the, he's definitely not going to be the strongest athlete you'll ever see. Um, so his current moving jump might actually not be that great. So if he was to do hands on hips, jump as high as you can from a dead stop. Let's say for the for the sake of argument, I don't have any stats. Let's say he produces a fifty centimeter counter movement jump, which is not great. Um, we've got some. I've got some. Well, we have some rugby athletes who can produce 62, 65 centimeter vertical jumps, but he's plyometrically outstanding. Whereas the majority of our rugby athletes, because they're used to operating on grass or they're not used to operating that kind of, they definitely don't play. We don't train them like track and field athletes. We train them like rugby players. Plyometrically, they won't be anywhere near as good. So their hurdle jumps will be abysmal compared to this guy. Whereas their standing vertical jump might be better. Their cleans will be much better. Their squats will be much better. Um, they'll be able to apply themselves against something like they'll run through someone a lot better than Stefan might be able to. Different kind of athletes train for different kind of activities. Now, to go as an aside to talk about how plyometrics would be useful for a boxer, um, and I haven't really trained any high level boxers. I haven't trained any high. Well, I haven't, I've, I've done a bit of training with a few Mike Thai fighters. Bit of training from BJJ, so my kind of knowledge or application within fight sports is reasonably limited. However, from a from just a purely conceptual basis or a purely theoretical basis, I can't really see how like an upper body plyometric is going to be massively useful for a fighter. Um, throwing a punch is all rotational; it's um, it is ballistic in nature. Whereas doing the clap press ups or being able to return force with your upper body is of those is of limited worth, probably very little worth to be honest. As regards your um, your punching power, ballistics training for the upper body and some general strength training for the upper body probably would help to a point. So if you didn't do, well, we just use boxing because it's quite a good analogy. If you didn't do any weight training and uh, doing some general weight training. From the fact that you don't do any strength training to some general strength training will have transfer. That transfer will probably end quite quickly. So as a boxer, there's no real need to be able to... So let's say you're a you're a 70 kilo boxer. As a 70 kilo boxer, if you can bench like 90 kilos, 100 kilos, that's probably going to be the limit for the, the transfer you're going to get. There's no need for Amir Khan to bench 140 because it's not going to help, help him throw a punch anymore. Whereas Amir Khan doing a bit of general strength training will help for definite, um, but only to quite a limited point. Uh, that's where I think quite a, quite a lot of this shit gets lost to translation because people think, oh, powerlifters, strong men, like they all lift really heavy weights and this is strength training. Yes, it is strength training, but it's strength training taken to the nth degree. That's kind of like, it's kind of the thinking like, we look at, for some reason, conditioning training doesn't really get the same stigma as strength training gets, but let's say, as a boxer trainer looking at um, looking at Paul Radcliffe or looking at, uh, what's the fuck's that guy's name? Uh, Mo, Mo Farah. Looking at Mo Farah, Paul Radcliffe. Ah, shit, man, I don't need to do any cardiovascular training. Look at these guys, they're all small, they're all weak, they're all like slow twitch fiber dominated. So I don't need to do that kind of training, but that's so I won't do any trail running. I won't do any steady state cardio, which obviously is ridiculous. You will do that because it's good general physical preparation. You will. You need to be cardiovascularly fit. You need to be. You need to be more fit than you need to be strong and powerful in boxing. Would be my uh, inclination. You don't really need. It's not really a strength power sport. It's more of a. It's more of an endurance sport. Obviously, there's quite a large element of speed, strength, and power in it. Um, 
was certainly, you know, you need to be, you need to be obscenely fit to be an elite boxer. So you need quite a lot of that endurance. You need a lot of cardiovascular training in, in your program. So, you know, the vast majority of elite boxers do some kind of steady state within their training somewhere. And whether it's a, a, like a 5k jog in the morning or something, like they do the training because there's worth in the training. There's a physical goal. There's a, there's a, there is a, a conditioning benefit to be had out the RN. But you don't look at Mo Farah and go, shit, I'm not doing that. Look at that guy. It's the same kind of rationale, the same kind of jumping off point is looking, of looking at Maris Puzanowski and go, that guy's far too big. Like, he's too slow. Like He's too ponderous. My endurance would be shit if I trained like him. Yeah, if you were a 70-kilo boxer and you took steroids and got 140 kilos like Mar- Marius Puzanowski and benched 250 kilos, you would be a shit boxer. But you're not going to do that because that's fucking ridiculous. You're talking in dichotomies, and that's where a lot of these things, like, and that's where I was kind of getting at with that speed of sport uh, rebuttal was that they talk a dichotomy. They talk in, look, powerlifting shit, weightlifting shit, that shit, because look at this reason, that reason, this reason. When they just they put up straw man arguments, and that's what they argue against. They don't actually. There is merit to what they say, and what I'm going to come across now is when we're talking about where could this be useful within boxing or with a Mai Tai or like a more stand-up dominated sport. Um, like simple plyometrics are simple things like skipping. You know that all boxers do and Mai Tai fighters do. That's really important because you need to be on your toes, you need to be reactive. That's good training. That's good simple plyometric training. That's plyometrics. So that's where it's useful. It's useful for footwork, staying on your toes, staying lively through the like having that endurance, having that ability to stay on your toes, be lithe, react, be quick. You know, you don't. You don't, they always say you don't want to get caught in your heels. So having the ability to stay on your toes, those toes that bounce around, be useful. You know that is plyometric training, but it's it's sport specific plyometric training that you already do. So you skip, you shadow box. Uh, you hit pads, you spar, where these things are honed in. So the guy holding the pads for you might, you know, if you get flat footed, might hit you in the head and go stay on your toes. Same way, it might hit in your head, like it might hit you in the head to keep your guard up. This training, this a lot, a lot of plyometric training happens naturally within sport. So, for example, you think you might think volleyball, basketball. There's a sport where I need to do plyometrics because they're jumping athletes. Or if you actually think about it, within a basketball game, there can be 50 kind of movement jumps. So if that's not uncommon for basketball athletes to train or to play twice in a week. So if they train twice in a week, they're doing 100 kind of movement jumps. There's not many programs or strength conditioning programs out there that will have an athlete doing 100 jumps. In a week, certainly not 100 kind of movement jumps. So maybe they just need to do a general weight training program. You know, they don't need to do box jumps and shit like that because they already do it. Or if they're already at a high level, this is another thing that a lot of people um, don't really think about or don't really twig is athletes who have got to an elite level already have the physical components they require to be there. So if LeBron James. Um, does a plays three games in a week, say. He does 150 plus vertical jumps. Um, he's a big rangy athlete. Does he need to do Olympic lifts? Or does he need to do jump training? Does he need to do loads of um, high high impact training? Or does LeBron James need to do a pretty well thought out machine based strength program is going to keep him on on the court I think LeBron might need to do something to keep him on the court rather than doing something to improve performance because LeBron's already performing at an outstanding level so you know it's it's different different scenarios different athletes different kind of training that should be utilised so it's not always about performance it's about specifically what you can do for that athlete at that time in that scenario. For some development developmental athletes, good strength training, good plyometrics training, 
um, well sequenced, put together, put into the season, you know, is what you should be doing. For elite athletes, maybe they just need some some general training, some general health. You know, it's not it's not clear cut. It's it's athlete specific, sport specific, scenario specific, point in the season specific. Everyone has their own unique demands, their own unique places, and they need to be treated as such. So we, I can't make um, general statements, although I probably should because I'd sell a lot more and we could probably get a lot, a lot more viewers. You can't just say shit because at the end of the day, it, it, it's context specific always. So yeah, I've probably rambled on enough. Hopefully that's answered your question. Um, and you've got a bit of an idea of where plyometrics, what plyometrics training is, and more importantly, where it would sit within um, an athlete's training. And hopefully I'll give you a little bit of context in like a combat athlete or a boxer, kind of where in their training that would be useful. So I think that's where you're coming from. Okay, thank you a lot for listening. That concludes this episode. I'm going to go get some food now. 26 fucking hell. That's a long ass episode. Uh, good question. Enjoyed answering a lot. Uh, any question you like answered, hopefully it won't take 30 minutes, uh, please send to speedpowerperformance, gmail.com. Leave a comment below. Always willing. Uh, always happy to get comments, even though I might not seem like it sometimes, but I definitely am. Really do appreciate it. Thanks for the PM, and I will be back hopefully on Wednesday with another episode. Try out. See you then. Slide, I came for you.